crowd. Ready? Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the uh, Rafiq Hariri Center of the Atlantic Council. My name is Fred Hoff. I'm a uh, senior fellow at the, uh, at the Rafiq Hariri Center. Uh, I'm delighted to uh, I'm delighted to see such a uh, such a large crowd this afternoon. I think that uh, one thing that everybody in this room can agree on, uh, regardless of uh, political orientation or anything else, is that on days like this in Washington D.C., it's a it's a good thing to have indoor work. <laughs> uh, on behalf of the Hariri Center and our co-sponsor. Uh, the Public International Law and Policy Group. I really would like to welcome you to this, uh, to this discussion, this conversation with Ambassador Stephen J. Rapp on war crimes in Syria, the challenge of promoting accountability and protecting civilians. If you'd like to join this discussion online, please use the hashtag ACSyria. We very much uh, welcome the co-sponsorship of the Public International Law and Policy Group, a pro bono law firm uh, whose leaders have participated in a blue ribbon committee uh, that has prepared a discussion paper uh, for a, uh, a forum, a tribunal that could ultimately prosecute Syrian atrocities. The reason we're here, though, today is to hear from a, uh, a former colleague whose work I admired and continue to admire uh, very much, Ambassador Steve Rapp. Uh, Steve is the ambassador at large in the Department of State for war crimes issues. He heads the Office of Global Criminal Justice, and he's had this job since September 2009. Among other things, he served with distinction in prosecutorial roles uh, having to do with atrocities in Sierra Leone and genocide in Rwanda. On a personal note, I'll say that from uh, March 2011, when this Syria crisis began, until September uh, 2012, when I set aside my own duties at the Department of State, uh, Steve and I uh, were colleagues in the search for uh, both political transition and accountability in the context of uh, Syria. I admired uh, Steve's dedication and energy very much. I believe that as a general matter, we are much better served uh, by our public servants than many of, us, uh, many of us realize in this country. In the, case of, uh, in the case of Steve Rapp, I think it's particularly true. Uh, this man is a, uh, is a true believer uh, who brings uh, energy, uh, dedication, and determination uh, to everything he does. Uh, but uh, more importantly than my admiration, I uh, recall very specifically that your work was deeply admired uh, by the Secretary of State. Uh, our format today will be that of a discussion. We'll start by giving Ambassador Rapp an opportunity to describe his mission for the United States government and the main challenges he faces in trying to accomplish that mission. He and I then will have a brief conversation after which I'll open the floor up uh, to your participation. And our goal this afternoon is to, uh, is to conclude at uh, 3.30 sharp. Uh, so Steve, welcome. Uh, we're deeply honored that you could find the time to, uh, to do this, this this afternoon. And uh, I'd like you to get things rolling. Describe your mission. Describe the things that, uh, that are keeping you from accomplish, <laughs> accomplishing it in, say, the next uh, 20 minutes or so. OK. <laughs> And, and that's a tall order, but uh, first of all, just generally, uh, uh, my office, uh, now called the Office of Global Criminal Justice, uh, been in the State Department now for, for 17 years, uh, 
David Sheffer, who you may know, is the first incumbent, and, and, and was established uh, in order to further our policy of accountability for mass atrocities and led U.S. engagement with the Yugoslavia and Rwanda Tribunal with the establishment of the court in Sierra Leone and, uh, and, uh, and in Cambodia and, and, and elsewhere, and also our engagement uh, with the International Criminal Court, not to join, but uh, increasingly uh, to, uh, to assist and support in, on a case-by-case -case basis as we can internationally in order to fulfill uh, the goal of, of holding those leaders responsible who have committed the worst crimes known to humankind. Uh, in the last 20 years, a lot has happened in this area. Indeed, uh, some have said it's the most dramatic change in, in the international system, the fact that people like a Milosevic, a president of Yugoslavia, were brought to justice in, in, in The Hague, that a Charles Taylor, whom I personally prosecuted, uh, uh, a former president of Liberia, is convicted of crimes against humanity and, and war crimes and sentenced to 50 years, a prime minister of Rwanda and officers of, uh, of the military and of that government and of uh, various state organs that participated in the genocide of 800,000 men, women, and children uh, just 20 years ago right now. Uh, those individuals have, have been held to account. And, and as we deal with, with what has been done, uh, people, we, we look at other situations, some past and sadly some, some very current, like that in Syria, where the documentation from the Syrian Observatory on Human Rights is more than 162,000 people killed. Uh, since um, uh, since uh, February, March of, of, of 2011, I mean, numbers now greater than in the former Yugoslavia and 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 in, and, and in Sierra Leone, and in, and in terms of the of the conduct of, of that of the government of the of the Assad government, a, a war uh, against its own people, beginning with the shooting of peaceful demonstrators uh, today to the dropping of barrel bombs on on civilian neighborhoods, and and over time uh, uh, to the to the torture and murder of, of thousands thousands of people in, in, in state custody. Of course, it's not just they that are doing the, the, the crimes there. Uh, they started that activity, and the vast majority are, are, are their responsibility. But now we have other groups in the armed opposition uh, uh, committing uh, other horrors. Uh, uh, beheadings and, and hangings of, of, of the innocent in, in, in public view uh, by, by groups like ISIS that have now uh, spread their poison in, in, into Iraq. And so uh, the challenge in my office, the challenge for all of us that believe in justice is uh, how do we take the lessons that we've learned uh, uh, at these international tribunals? How do we fulfill the expectations of the victims and the survivors of, of what's happened in, uh, in, in, in Syria? Um, there are different ways to do that, ways that we already are, ways that we already can af affect the situation. Uh, they're not as satisfying as, as they might be, but we're, but we're, we're looking at, at every possible alternatives, as you discussed, and as the Public Interest Law and Policy Group is also working on. But first of all, we're, we're doing a fantastic job of documenting what's going on out there. You remember when we were at the Friends of the Syrian People in April of, of uh, 2012 in Istanbul, in Istanbul Secret right. Se Secretary Clinton announced our support for, for documentation, for the establishment of an international center uh, supported by our government and now uh, at least 40 other governments that uh, is also supporting uh, groups in the field that are collecting documentation. And they're actually um, uh, rounding, <laughs> getting close to gathering more than a million pages. <laughs> Of, of documents, it's 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 incredible to believe, but this uh, the, the Syrian government has has a mania for for documentation that we haven't seen since the Khmer Rouge uh, or, or the Nazis, uh, and certainly an example of that is are, are these Caesar photos, uh, so called, because of the report done by some of my former international prosecution colleagues in in January, but since that time uh, these photos have been made available to law enforcement agencies uh, around the world, and uh, and they're being analyzed and and to date, uh, what, uh, what those guys said was there in January is there. Uh, evidence of thousands of, of, of individuals uh, tortured to death. Uh, uh, individuals that have been strangled and, and, and mutilated, uh, gouged, burned, starved. And, 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 and I've seen hundreds of these images in the, and, and, and on their faces. You can see the, the horrible agony of their hours of life, but, but documented with a card with the number of the death uh, uh, and uh, in the thousands of, of individuals in order to prove to somebody, yes, indeed, uh, uh, we did kill that guy and we, and we killed him with, uh, uh, in, in, in a truly uh, uh, horrible way. 
Uh, time was they were arresting people and letting them go after, in order to sort of discourage others. But now we see this, this intense effort to, uh, uh, to, to murder uh, after, uh, after torture with, with thousands of, of, of victims. Question is what, what can we do about, we can document it. We of course have a commission of inquiry uh, uh, which uh, uh, we, we've strongly supported and which has uh, been supported by the Human Rights Council with 40 of the, or more of the members, only a couple of dissenters in, in establishing uh, this uh, uh, commission of inquiry uh, that's been documenting the horrors there. And, and you know, obviously we also have the denial of humanitarian access. Uh, we've got laws uh, and rules that have been in effect for 150 years uh, uh, where, uh, uh, where you didn't target ambulances or doctors or nurses, and now, in fact, those people are being targeted. Uh, uh, they're, they're in greater danger almost uh, than, the, than the civilians. This is being effectively documented by this UN Commission of, of Inquiry, as, as its chair, uh, Paula Panero, said uh, uh, two weeks ago in, in, in Geneva, we, what we have in Syria is, is almost like an, uh, you know, uh, uh, impunity has found a home. Uh, my job is to, to, to make sure that it, that, uh, uh, that, uh, that that ends and that there is no impunity and that individuals are brought to account. What can we do right now? First of all, I think it's important to note that uh, uh, when we get this documentation and we, when we see that among these victims are the nationals of, of other states, as, as has already been shown, whether they're north or south, national authorities like our own can have jurisdiction of these cases. Uh, people can be charged who are in that, that hierarchy, which is relatively easy to, to show. I mean, you've got 24 uh, facilities in which those torture murders took place. Who was in command? Who were the, who were the individuals uh, depicted uh, in, in the photos above the bodies? The, that kind of evidence uh, can give states the ability to prosecute uh, those even before you've got an international court. I mentioned Charles Taylor Sr. I mean, I got him 50 years and my successor did uh, at the international level. His son, Charles Taylor Jr., made the mistake of flying through Miami, Florida, uh, and was picked up by immigration, by US officials. Eventually, they found out what he had done in Liberia of torturing people to death. He was tried by a jury in, in, uh, in Florida, sentenced to 97 years, and is today serving 97 years in federal prison for crimes that he committed in Liberia. So those kind of cases can be built. And the signal to folks is there's not going to be any place to shop. There's not going to be any place to go visit your children or family or diaspora in. Uh, you're going to face consequences. That's, that's something we can build on already. Uh, beyond that, of course, we want to see about uh, justice uh, in Syria in the future, hopefully with, uh, with peace and, and certainly as part of peace. The idea of accountability has to be essential to it because it's impossible to imagine uh, a Syria that would, that would go forward uh, with those that have been responsible for killing or torturing thousands of individuals holding, holding key positions. So it's got to, uh, what we build, what we plan for in terms of the future with the Syrian people has to be something in which there's appropriate accountability. But we can also look at, at international approaches. We tried, as everyone knows, to go to the uh, Security Council of the, of the United Nations and support of our French uh, allies uh, to, to refer this case to the ICC, a, a vote that occurred on the 22nd of May of, of, of 2014. Uh, uh, you know, you've got uh, Soviet, or call them Soviets. I shouldn't do that here at the Atlantic <laughs> Council. But go right ahead. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's okay. Uh, a, uh, uh, acting like it. But uh, uh, Russians and, 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 and Chinese vetoes uh, that, that block that referral. But there are other alternatives, yes. and I think we can, we can talk about ways uh, that, that they can be developed. Uh, uh, we've, in other places, uh, been, been, been creative. For instance, uh, uh, I mentioned uh, the Cambodian uh, case. In the Cambodian case, the, uh, uh, the uh, UN General Assembly asked the Secretary General to negotiate with Cambodia the creation of a hybrid court. And following up on that, we have the extraordinary chambers in Cambodia uh, with, uh, with international judges and national judges with the leaders of the Khmer Rouge being tried. We're contributing financially to it. We're part of the committee that decides on, money, on management and budget. In uh, Senegal, for instance, or, or Chad, uh, you had uh, a leader, uh, Hissen Habre, that's accused of, of killing thousands and of torturing uh, tens of thousands when he was in power. He fled to, to Senegal. Now Senegal uh, has entered into an agreement with the African Union. By reason of Senegal's jurisdiction, uh, it's able to put that together with the African Union and establish an extraordinary chamber to try crimes committed in Chad in an international court in, uh, in Senegal. Uh, there are 
ideas that I think need to be explored. Uh, we're not endorsing any of them uh, in terms of the, of the US government, but we want to work with others, particularly with Syrians, particularly with those that have been involved in this, and with others in the region, uh, to begin building for, for the day when this evidence will be presented in a court in law, of law, and, and when the individuals responsible for these crimes will be tried. Terrific. Well, Steve, as you, you know, as you, as you, as you look at the situation in Syria, as you compare it, uh, with other cases you've been involved with. Uh, do you see anything, anything peculiar about this uh, particular case? Anything, uh, anything special? Or is it all just the same, the same pattern that, you, that you've seen in Sierra Leone and, and elsewhere? Well, as, as I indicated earlier, uh, one of the aspects of it that's remarkable is, is in other places uh, uh, people make more effort to cover their tracks. <laughs> to be frank, uh, uh, to, to refer to, to acts of, of killing and torture with, with euphemisms uh, to uh, divorce themselves from the chain of command. That happens to some extent in Syria. You've got groups like the Shabia and others that may go out and commit some horrible hand-to-hand -hand kind of violence. And they're, you know, the, uh, directly tying that to the regime would require evidence, which I think is, is, is there. But, uh, uh, but, it, but as we see with the, with the Caesar photos, the, the, this, this government and the security services and, and those involved in this, this complex uh, structure of, of political power in that country uh, uh, don't, really, don't really hide their tracks. So I think it, uh, it gives us uh, uh, a lot more to work for and, and work with. Uh, in, in, in the future, and, uh, and the idea that somehow this is all going to be swept under the rug, that, uh, that these kind of crimes, that these kind of horrors uh, are going to be forgotten, is impossible in our world. And, mm -hmm. and those of us that have worked in this field and that are, that are part of governments around the world uh, will uh, we'll press until the day of justice arrives. Who, and, and, and on that day, who's, whose call is it, ultimately? Uh, you know, you hear, you hear learned discussions about uh, accountability, reconciliation, justice, all of this. Uh, what, is, what is the role of the Syrian people in all of this? What's the role of the international community? In the end, how, how would you envision a decision being made to move forward on the basis of this, this enormous volume of documentation that's, that's been accumulated? Well, the, the essential decision is, is for the Syrian people, but, but do keep in mind that there are certain crimes that, that go beyond national concern. I mean, the world in 2005, in, in unanimously adopting the responsibility to protect, said that, that every government uh, in the world, uh, and in default of that government's action, uh, international organizations and, and other states are, are responsible for preventing genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and, and, and ethnic cleansing. And, and clearly, we've proceeded in, in cases uh, uh, like the prosecution of Milosevic or others, uh, where the particular state uh, at the time wouldn't have wouldn't have wanted uh, that uh, that charge, and perhaps the, the people in, in in some parts of, of that country or area didn't want that the, that accountability. But when the crimes are so extreme, there is no out. I mean, as, mm -hmm. as the as the Secretary uh, Kerry said at the London Sexual Violence Summit, when it comes to these mass crimes like the crimes. Of, of sexual violence that are committed as crimes against humanity or war crimes, uh, there is no amnesty. There is no possibility. Nothing that's ever written on paper will, uh, uh, and agreed to by anybody, uh, would prevent uh, prosecutions of, of those crimes. So we have to ra raise, mm -hmm. recognize uh, that, that very real reality. Uh, at the same time, however, uh, when, a, when a society has gone through this kind of convulsions, one does not want everyone prosecuted. One doesn't want debathification. Obviously, we had it in Iraq unsuccessfully, and we've got a bath party here too, and, and we wouldn't want it here. We want ways in which people that have been followers, that have been uh, uh, sort of uh, marched into this, uh, can redeem themselves and reconcile with their neighbors. And, uh, but we want those who are the authors of these crimes to face consequences. And, and the pattern internationally has been uh, certainly if, if, if countries uh, with, a, with a fair and balanced justice system want to do it themselves, 
uh, that's, that's always our preference. Sometimes when you have the more senior leadership, uh, and in order to make, make sure that that's a fair and balanced process, you look sometimes for, for international organizations or for mixed courts uh, to be involved in that kind of thing. Uh, but for the larger group of individuals, uh, you, you largely look for, for, for national institutions. But, but those institutions need to be uh, ones that are representative of every community. And you obviously, as, as we clearly see in, in Syria, Alawites, Sunnis, uh, Christians, Kurds, uh, other, other communities, uh, uh, they have to be represented in that judicial process. And, and, and that's one of the advantages sometimes also having internationals. I saw it in Bosnia, yeah. where even after the Yugoslavia Tribunal, we established uh, worked in establishing a state court war crimes chamber at the national level with judges from each of the three major communities there, but also with international judges that were there for six years. So that when victims came in and they looked across the room and they saw the investigator or a judge or prosecutor or whatever, and that was somebody from the other group, they, made it, they might not have been confident, they might, not, they might have been fearful, but when they see internationals mixed in, they realize that uh, there's a good chance that those prejudices have, have been sure. checked at the door. So there are advantages to that kind of international participation, uh, particularly in a mixed sense. Uh, but we'll see what, what works here. What I think is important, at the very least, is that people recognize that this is going to happen and that we need to begin talking about what, what essential elements are, are going to have to be mm -hmm. part of it. And, and, and also to, to strengthen the perception that justice will be here and the hope that we can deter some of the conduct, encourage people to desert, discourage people in the opposition from uh, taking an eye for an sure. eye. Sure, sure. Well, in, in this respect, what, what would be your reaction, your advice, if in the fullness of time uh, we're faced with the following proposition? President Bashar al-Assad and 200 of his closest enablers are willing to leave Syria forthwith and bring an end to at least one phase of this, uh, of this conflict in return for immunity from prosecution. Is that doable under current, under current conditions? Is it is it unthinkable? Well, how would you well, react all, if, I don't if, we were, I, if we were actually presented yeah. with, a, with a proposition mm -hmm. like this? Well, first of all, um, you know, I'm not, I've, I've not seen any evidence that, that this guy or the people around him are, are ready to go this is a uh, at, 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 any, at, at any point. And that's often what's presented here, that well, if you gave the guy a, a bolt hole or a place to go, we could get him out. And, yeah, uh, yeah. and, uh, and usually uh, that's not the case. Or you have a situation like we had in uh, Sierra Leone in 99 where they agreed to an amnesty. I mean, Charles Taylor helped broker an amnesty between the, the, the rebels that had been chopping off hands and raping women by the thousands and, uh, and, uh, and committing such horrible crimes. They got a full amnesty. Mm -hmm. uh, they agreed to disarm. They didn't disarm. <laughs> Within a year, they were, they were out reoffending. And that's, and that's the problem with any of these kinds of amnesties from a practical standpoint. The signal is sent. You can get away with it. <laughs> so the next time you're, you, you want to gain or hold political power, you do the same thing confident that you're going to be able to walk again. That's not how we enforce the law in our country. That's not how we build the rule of law anywhere in the, anywhere in the world. But, but fundamentally, from an international point of view, it is one thing to say, you can go, and there's, uh, at the time that they go, there may not be a court with, with jurisdiction created, and, uh, and, and uh, you say it's better for you to go and to stop your, your crimes. Uh, it's, it's another thing to then turn around and say, oh, now you have a, a get-out-of-jail-free card for the rest of your life. And uh, as a matter of, of international law, uh, I'm, you know, talked about different countries may have different policies and different approaches to this, but as a matter of international law, that's not possible. It would not be binding. It okay. would not prevent uh, a prosecutor like myself going after Charles Taylor or somebody else from prosecuting in the future, full stop these crimes are too serious for that. Okay, well since you've, since you've allowed me the opening mm -hmm. of, a, of a hypothetical question, I'll, uh, I'll explain <laughs> One of the things it. they always I'll tell us at the State fully. Department is we yes. don't ask, answer hypothetical questions. We don't answer questions. hypotheticals. <laughs> uh, but perhaps, perhaps you could uh, give, give this one a try. If, if you were Bashar al-Assad's attorney, and if he were taking uh, your counsel 
about his uh, potential, his personal potential liabilities in all of this. What, what, would you be, what, would, what would you be telling him in terms of his liabilities, and what would you be advising him in terms of a, of a future course of action to minimize whatever liability he might have? Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's hard to talk hypothetically knowing what uh, we know about uh, the, the conduct and having seen the documents, of course. Well, assume, the end of the assume day, anyway, as, his, these as, are just, as his attorney, you know all <laughs> but the, the But the facts. accusations uh, yeah. are, are, are out there. Uh, I mean, my advice always to, to someone who's, who could be held responsible for these crimes is, uh, uh, one, it's not too late to stop, <laughs> you know, and you only make it worse by continuing the crimes, the kind of thing we, take, we say to any hostage holder, uh, mm -hmm. don't make it worse for yourself, stop now. Uh, without saying, oh, we'll forgive you killing the 15 people that you killed. Take the hostages. We don't say that. Uh, uh, we don't make that kind of promise. But it's better to, to stop. Secondly, uh, consistent with the law of command responsibility, that uh, to the extent that uh, the individual begins some kind of process to hold people to account, uh, who've committed these crimes, uh, they, they send the signal that, you know, perhaps uh, they weren't completely in the know. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and certainly if you can show that you took action to prevent or punish conduct, one of the easier routes uh, to, uh, to conviction of someone at the international level is, uh, um, is barred. Uh, you know, depends on how quick the guy acted and all, all sorts of things. I don't want to say it's completely barred. But to the extent that he says, look, this kind of conduct uh, is not something that I support. These individuals who ran these prisons, et cetera, should be, uh, should be charged. And in, in not a scapegoating kind of process, yeah. but in a fair and just one, that if you take that kind of step, uh, then it's good. And that's why when people are engaged in peace negotiations elsewhere, and they say, oh, we don't want to even talk about this here, say, no, 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 get in there and say, look, if you want to be in good shape, you should be talking about accountability measures. <laughs> What are you going to do about these horrible crimes that have been committed? What are you going to do about these out-of-control soldiers or, or political zealots or extremists or people motivated by religious or ethnic hatred? What are you going to, what's your action on that? To the extent that you come forward with, with plans in that area, that would increase your, uh, uh, I mean, the, the chance that you wouldn't be a target for, for prosecution. Keeping in mind that it's also any international prosecutor is also uh, vested with discretion about what case is appropriate and one, one, which okay. one isn't. And, uh, and the tendency is to go to the person uh, who's the most responsible, but also to those that have, that have uh, shown that not only uh, didn't they uh, stop the crimes, they also encouraged the crimes, et, et cetera. Now, obviously, this is, this is, this is challenging given the stage we're in in, in, in Syria. But uh, it's, it's, it's never too late to, to, to get right on, on that kind of issue. And that would help him far better than continuing. Obviously, his hope is that he can uh, kill every, every uh, last uh, opponent, that he can do what his father did in Hama in 1982. But you know, we are way beyond that. This is spread beyond the area, 162,000 dead, millions displaced, uh, uh, ancient uh, animosities and, and inflamed, et cetera. This is, not, uh, this is not something where you can have a military victory like a conventional uh, war. This is something that will remain a, uh, a, a, a tense and, ex and conflicted situation. So the idea that you, can, that you can kill his way out of this thing, that doesn't work either. Okay. You, you, mentioned, you mentioned earlier the work of the, uh, the Commission of Inquiry, mm -hmm. which is connected to the Human Rights Council and the reports it's, uh, it's rendered. And the fact that uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity in Syria are not exclusively the province of the Assad regime, uh, that there have been uh, other bad actors mm -hmm. as well. Right. Uh, is there... In terms of international law, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, judicial proceedings, ultimately, is there a distinction to be drawn between state actors and non-state actors? In other words, if, uh, if one could get one's hand on uh, Mr. Baghdadi, is there, is there, uh, would he be subject uh, potentially to the same kinds of uh, procedures? that a president of the republic might be? Or is there, is there a distinction between public and private here? 
Well, in the, in the law book that we follow in these international tribunals, basically there's no distinction. Uh, and keep in mind that at the, uh, at the, at the International uh, Court for Sierra Leone, the people that we prosecuted there, like the leaders of the RUF and uh, uh, the leaders of even the CDF and AFRC, we prosecuted for crimes committed uh, when they weren't in state power. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and they were found guilty of war crimes and crimes against humanity and other violations of international humanitarian law. Uh, international human rights law works a little differently when it comes to these things. But, uh, but when you talk about the, the atrocity crimes, uh, both sides are, are, are uh, all sides uh, are equally subject to, to, those, to, those, uh, to those laws. And so uh, the leader of ISIS, Mr. al-Baghdadi, uh, uh, could be held responsible, obviously, in terms of the, of the kind of evidence that uh, the, this organization has put out on YouTube and, and other places of, 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 of cold-blooded killings of, of individuals in, 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 in public view and of them boasting about those particular killings and, and from a high level uh, clearly aware of them and, and condoning them. Uh, you've got actually a, an awfully good case uh, right now, uh, one that you could uh, take to a, uh, to, to a judge tomorrow uh, if, you had, uh, if you had a court uh, uh, constituted. In that, in that regard, if, if you think about uh, uh, future prosecutions, is the state of the existing documentation right now, in your view, uh, sufficient to move forward? In various avenues, and could you could you say a little bit about about how who's actually involved in the collection of, of documentation on you know war crimes, crimes against humanity in Syria? How many how many cooks are there in the kitchen here, and and is there is there somewhere a coordination mechanism in all of this so that uh, someone at least knows what's coming in, and is it is it all assembled in one place? Well, there, there, there are efforts to coordinate these things, and obviously complicated when you don't have a, a court that's specifically been given jurisdiction uh, over the crime. And, and where, frankly, uh, we want to collect uh, everything that's available, and we want to work very closely with Syrians. I mean, my first engagement uh, in, in this issue was, was going out to Istanbul and, and, and training uh, Syrian lawyers and others that had then come just out of uh, the conflict. Yeah. Some of them were moving uh, back and forth across the borders in, in what kind of evidence was important for proving command responsibility, for responsibility of political leaders and, and, and for others. Also in, in clearly communicating to them the importance uh, of, of abiding by international law for, for the armed opposition. Uh, clearly important that, that, that they respect civilians, that they don't uh, that just because a member of their community is killed in cold blood, that they don't take uh, take action against an innocent person of, of, of a community that's perceived to be supporting Assad. So uh, that's been something that we, we've encouraged. Now, as in April of, of 2012, Secretary uh, Clinton announced that we would support the establishment of a Syrian Justice and Accountability Center. That's uh, been now established, funded by the United States, by 40 other countries, and uh, it's serving as a clearinghouse. It's providing guidelines and expertise to various other groups that are doing the collection. It's not actually doing the collection it's, it, itself. And so it's established this sort of a network of, of contacts. One of the groups, who's uh, the Syrian Commission on Justice and Accountability, uh, headed by Canadian Bill Wiley, but with a substantially Syrian uh, staff, has been very active. It's been supported by our Syrian Justice and Accountability Center, also by the EU, now has a budget of $6 million a year. And it's specifically focusing on linkage evidence. Because if you look at the international trials, and you look at some of those where sometimes the bad guy got away, it was because of the absence, not of the evidence that somebody was raped and murdered or that there were thousands of victims. It's connecting the dots between the, the, the retail killer and the person at the wholesale level that's really responsible, but you've got to, you've got to uh, uh, have that kind of linkage. This group's focused on the linkage, and it's uh, collected hundreds of thousands of pages of documents uh, from buildings and the security services and political committees and security committees as those have, have fallen to the opposition and has been able to get that, uh, those documents out of the country. And it's analyzed them and built cases, and, and a quarter of its dossiers uh, 
uh, are on the opposition, specifically on ISIS, uh, but also uh, on, on others. So though the, the trove of physical documents isn't quite as great there as it is with the regime, there, yeah. there is evidence. The, the uh, Commission of Inquiry, as, as Chairman Pinero said to the, uh, to the Human Rights Council in Geneva on the 17th, it's collected 3,000 uh, 3, statements of, of, of uh, victims and survivors of these crimes, et cetera. And with, with protection of, of sources, that kind of material can be made available, at least for a leads purposes for, for, uh, for future prosecution. Uh, given the fact that what we've done at the international level is often talk about representative crimes, you can't prosecute everything. You prosecute the strongest cases you have of rape, the strongest cases you have of enslavement, mutilation, use of child soldiers, murder, whatever. Uh, uh, frankly, the, the trove is already rich enough. Uh, I wish the crime stopped today because <laughs> there'd, be, there'd be plenty to go on. But, but frankly, it's important to continue to collect uh, uh, this, yeah. this information uh, to be able, uh, and, and certainly to be sending the signal to anyone that's, that's out there that is being perhaps tempted by some action on the other side to commit these kinds of crimes to realize that there'll be consequences for them too. Uh, you know, the, the, the tactical situation on the ground in Syria these days uh, seems to be not very, not very favorable to the opposition. Uh, some people are coming to the conclusion uh, that the Assad regime has, uh, you know, has essentially won, uh, that questions of accountability are really not terribly relevant. I'm wondering in your own, in your own discussions with, uh, with Syrian opposition people, uh, does this question come up about the, about the relevance of, of accountability data? And, and given, given the sheer quantity of evidence that's been collected, uh, does this in any way inhibit the ability of the United States in the future to work with the Assad regime if the Assad regime becomes a more or less permanent feature? There are people out there who are saying that, quite frankly, we should go back to uh, Bashar al-Assad and, and strike some kind of a deal. What, what kind of inhibition is created by, by the sheer volume of, uh, of evidence? Well, I mean, it's the uh, inhibition cr you know, created, I suppose, by the truth of, of, of what's happened there and by the fact that that truth is undeniable. Uh, um, but f fundamentally, we have to uh, recognize that what we have with this regime and its key actors is that its legitimacy, its ability to, to serve the, the public of Syria is, is gone, if, it, uh, if ever it were there. And, and frankly, in my discussions uh, at a time when Peace negotiations aren't moving forward. Uh, we'd like them to move forward, yeah. but uh, people are even stronger on, on the on the accountability issue, as you, as you see it going to the Security Council of the UN in May, uh, uh, because uh, it is so important uh, to clearly get this information out there and and have it understood that this kind of conduct uh, uh, isn't it can't be the, the the conduct that that enables someone to maintain maintain power. Uh, as, as a matter of our whole global system, as the matter of the, the protection of the rights of, of, of victims, as a matter of protecting uh, civilians. Uh, everything that we work for, everything that we uh, have struggled to build is put in danger if uh, this kind of conduct is, is, is rewarded. So all the more reason to emphasize accountability, all the more reason to say uh, uh, people that commit conduct like this need to go and, uh, and uh, <laughs> Uh, and they will face consequences uh, even if they don't go. There will be consequences uh, as, 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 the future, as, as we move into the future. Good, thank you. I would, uh, I'd like to uh, offer the audience uh, an opportunity to, uh, to pose some questions here. Uh, what, I, what I would ask is that uh, as, I, as I designate you to uh, pose a question, please pose a question, be, be as, uh, as brief as you can, and please state your name and your affiliation. First one in the back there. Uh, hi, my name is Amar Abdel Hamid of the Tharwa Foundation. Uh, I have uh, two very specific questions, but uh, first of all, I want to just have a reminder. When referring to ISIS, please refer to them as a third party to the conflict and not as part of the rebel alliance, mm -hmm. because their entire strategy so far 
uh, really clearly indicates that they are not interested in the, in the revolution and the early goals of the revolution. So I think it's fairer to the rebel alliance for them to be seen as a third party impinging itself on a very complicated scene. Uh, the questions I actually have is um, the intervention in Bosnia uh, was justified by using the term acts of genocide. Now, can what happened in Syria, especially the crimes perpetrated by the Assad, pro-Assad militias, and considering the available evidence of what's happening in the detention camps and the liquidation of prisoners and so on, and the ethnic cleansing that took part in different parts of the country, can this be classified as acts of genocide? And does this classification uh, sort of gives the crimes that are happening more urgency, more legal, uh, 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 immediacy uh, that puts them above, for instance, the categorization of crimes against humanity or mass slaughter. Uh, the second question is that at one point uh, early in the revolution, uh, Bashar al-Assad issued a presidential decree. Um, I cannot remember right now the exact number, but I can send you the information if you want it. But in that decree, he actually said uh, that all crimes perpetrated by members of the security establishment and that means soldiers, policemen, members of the even the popular militias that were allowed to form uh, at the time, all of the crimes would be granted amnesty. So within the conduct of their uh, jobs, if a soldier kills, tortures, steals, rapes, all these are considered crimes. All these crimes are uh, will be, according to this degree, will not be considered that uh, uh, these soldiers will have amnesty. So doesn't that make, legally speaking, Bashar al-Assad directly responsible for every crime that has been perpetrated by each and every member of the security establishment since the beginning of the revolution to date? And doesn't that help in the prosecution to actually have that decree and refer to it? Because in a sense, you don't even need a chain of command anymore. You just, you just have this decree in which the president of the country is basically telling the members of security establishment, do what you want. Thank you. Forgiven. OK. If I can go ahead and respond to that. Yeah. It, it, it was right a ahead. long question. I know I could respond maybe to several at the same time. First of all, I, I certainly don't want to indicate that, that ISIS or ISIS is, uh, is, is part of the, of, of the rebel alliance that, that's fighting for a democratic transition in country. Uh, and, and, and obviously, we, we want to see uh, the, the, the moderate opposition, including followers of Islam, uh, uh, be part of a future Syria. And, and ISIS, in the way that it's conducted itself, in the exclusionary way that it's conducted uh, every bit of its operations, the way it kills uh, anybody that it runs into from any of the other groups, uh, I think is, 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 is beyond the pale. So make that absolutely clear. Uh, but then in, in terms of your two questions on, on the genocide issue, uh, and uh, not to get directly into the, to the history of, of Bosnia, what, what, as far as the situation in Bosnia, the only crime that's been recognized at the international court is, is genocide, was the murder of the 8,000 men and boys in, in, uh, uh, in Srebrenica that happened in July of 95, relatively late in that conflict. Before that time, horrendous war crimes, horrendous crimes against humanity. And, and uh, even though I prosecuted genocide in the Rwanda uh, context where 800,000 people were killed based on ethnicity, uh, in other situations like Cambodia where two million were killed, it may not have been a genocide. Uh, I don't think that we should place these crimes on a hierarchy. The kind of crimes that have been committed in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Syria are every bit as serious as those that have been committed elsewhere in situations that, in which there was a recognized genocide. But to have a genocide, you'd have to show a desire to kill all of the Sunnis, or at least the Sunnis in significant part. You'd have to have crossed that particular line. And, and that would, uh, and to sort of focus on that issue as opposed to the mass killings of civilians on a political or other kind of basis, I think is, is, uh, is, is to get caught up in, in, in legalisms. Fundamentally, horrible atrocities requires international response, requires it under the responsibility to protect that talks about genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity in, in, the, in, in the same paragraph. In terms of the responsibility of Assad on, on the basis of the amnesty, obviously the amnesty is evidence of a desire not to punish 
these cr crimes. It's also a signal that you don't want them prevented because obviously if, if people go out and commit them tomorrow, you're saying you're gonna give them an amnesty the next day. So that is very, very good evidence. For command responsibility, you also have to show that he was in effective control of, of, of these units. So it's not uh, automatic, but obviously extremely valuable evidence when it comes to holding uh, a leader uh, responsible as a commander. You know, in late, uh, in that connection, in late 2011, mm -hmm. I, I guess it was, uh, President Assad sat for an interview with Barbara Walters. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and his essential argument, if I, if I recall it correctly uh, from those days, was, was, look, bad things are happening, uh, but I'm, I'm the president of the republic. I, I can't be responsible uh, for things that are that are happening at the at the working at the working level. How does that how does that stand up as a as a defense in a in a general matter? Well, uh, I mean, it's 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 what you generally hear uh, in a number of these situations. It's what Charles Taylor said uh, in regard to the RUF. It's what Milosevic, uh, whose case had not yet come to verdict when he died, though very strong evidence was presented, and, and most legal commentators believe that he would have been found guilty. But, uh, but you show uh, uh, through the kind of linkage evidence uh, that you have commands from, from a high level. You, you, you have uh, witnesses who, who, who describe uh, situations in which the leader was made aware of certain crimes and certain activities. Uh, then you get uh, evidence like uh, we just indicated uh, that despite these horrors uh, that, are, that, are, that are out there, that people are receiving amnesty what, and, and they're receiving it if they committed the crime. And, does the and so all does of those things would, would tend yeah. to uh, uh, to make the, the statement in front of Barbara Walters or the statement uh, yeah. uh, in, in a court uh, eventually not not carry very much. Does weight the at command all. evidence exist in this case, in your view? The uh, yes, <laughs> I mean this is not this this is a, a hierarchical regime with a political stru I mean an administrative structure and a Ba'ath Party structure with the same person on top of it. This is a situation in which uh, uh, clearly. Uh, there's, a, there's a high command and, and a responsiveness uh, through, those, through those chains of, of command. This is a situation in which documents have come out of the, the uh, command centers uh, at, at the highest level and uh, where then the evidence of the crimes were notorious and, and where clearly there has been no, nothing, zero effort uh, to hold anybody accountable, no matter how vicious, no matter how horrid uh, the conduct of, of, of the security forces of the Syrian Arab Republic. Okay, let's take question up front here. Hi there, I'm Tyler Thompson with United for a Free Syria. Uh, I'm a proud alum of the Public International Law and Policy Group, so I'm happy they're co-hosting here today. A lot of familiar faces. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Rapp. Um, I just want to know how your office or how the administration in general um, is using accountability in Syria to drive the parties to a political solution. And secondly, what are the risks to the United States' interest in pressing harder on accountability? Thanks. Well, I mean, as I think I indicated earlier, the, the issue of accountability is, is essential to the, to the, to the question of the, of the future of, of Syria and, and that those that are, that are implicated in, in serious violations, that have blood on their hands, that are, are the kind of people that are not likely to be accepted by folks on the other side whose, whose brothers, sisters, mothers, and sons they've murdered, uh, that, that a future Syria has to uh, basically exclude the, those, those kind of individuals. And, uh, and even though there may be others that uh, have been in, in, in positions, uh, those that have taken action to end those policies, uh, that those kind of individuals uh, um, are, are, are the kind of people that, that could be leaders in, in, in the future of Syria. So, you know, and, and that justice is about individual criminal responsibility, not collective responsibility. It's not all the Alawites, it's not all the people who believe in, uh, 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 in a future caliphate. I mean, I, not these people that are responsible for these crimes. It's specific individuals that have, that have taken on responsibility for, for, for mass murder of, of, and, and other acts against civilians. And that 
that by excluding those individuals and prosecuting them, the society redeems itself and, and enables it to go forward. And in, in places where there has been, like in Sierra Leone or elsewhere, a peaceful transition after horrors, even in the capital city, it's been a situation where certain top level individuals are held responsible and, and their reconciliation methods uh, for others. So that we think that's consistent with, with, it, with a Syria with it that's peaceful, that's not in continued uh, conflict. It may not be consistent with having some papered over solution that blows up the next day. We want real peace in Syria. We want real transition. We want real democracy uh, in which are appropriate uh, uh, to that country where people of every community uh, have, have a voice and a part. Good. We have a question in the, uh, in the rear. My name is Mohammed Abdallah, I'm the director of Syria Justice and Accountability Center. Thank you, Ambassador, uh, for, for your remarks. I have actually a, a, sh a short observation I want to share with you. It's, as, as you mentioned, we're involved inherently in documentation on the ground. And in the last six months, we hired people, full-time staff, to document ourselves, not only to Good. rely on people's documentation or other group. But in this process, we've been s facing very important challenges. People no longer believe in the accountability itself. It's been, it's the fourth year, and the government of Bashar al-Assad used everything to the level of chemical arms against people. And even the people who inherently were activists, I met with, I worked with in Syria before I left to, to the US, no longer believes in this. They either left the country or in prison, or turn on to be armed people. And they don't want to continue this work. And especially when you go to the Security Council and you get veto easily on the ICC referral. People losing the interest and losing the faith. And I don't want to go further, but I can go far and say that contributed to establish ISIS and other extremist group because the inadequate action of the international community, regardless of how many people killed or the way get, get killed of, that contributed a lot to, to force people to pick up arms, to defend themselves, and then they skewed their way and they went to, to violations. How we can help people to stay on track? And I'm facing a very hard time in doing this because lo lots of people, when you tell them that what IHL says or what, what the Roman statute says, oh yeah, lecture to us from Washington. We're here under barrel bombs, under squad missiles, and it's it's easy thing to lecture from us to us from abroad. Thanks. If I if I could just yeah, add if I could just add to that in a practical sense, mm -hmm. I mean, quite aside from from dealing with the with the question of, uh, of frustration now that we're in the in the fourth year of uh, of this catastrophe. Are, are you finding uh, that, there is a, that there is a growing sense of pessimism uh, that's actually putting a damper on your ability to collect pertinent information? Well, I don't think there's a, there, there's a damper. I just as, as I said, I'm off to the region uh, to, to a board meeting of one of the groups that uh, the SJAC supports. And, and they were concerned about their funding for the coming year. And they both said that they now have commitments uh, for the coming year. Uh, now, of course, anyone that's, that's gone through this horror, that's, that's lost family members, that, is, that has seen the, the situation uh, go on and on, and one horror following a, another, is, is naturally going to be discouraged, as, as people might have in the darkest days of the Balkans wars that uh, went on for four years in, in Bosnia and eight years across the, across the region. And, and at times, there were people that said that's, that there's not going to be accountability here. It's never going to happen. You can even establish a court. It'll just get some junior people. It'll never get the top leaders. And, and eventually, they're there. Eventually, Milosevic is arrested. Even, even 16 years after uh, his indictment, there's, there's Mladic, uh, you know, in the helicopter being flown to the detention center at, at The Hague, uh, that uh, the, the, the day will arrive of, of justice uh, in, in these situations. I deal with situations in Latin America, or Cambodia, or elsewhere, you know, where the, where the crimes are committed uh, 30 or more years ago, and, and things are happening. That, that's not much to, to live on uh, at the moment. But that commitment is there, and the way in which uh, our government, the way that others, the way that 13 members of the Security Council, I mean, that'd be an overwhelming majority out of 15 in any other body sure. in the world, uh, vote for, uh, for a resolution to send this to the, to the ICC, uh, that indicates the desire re remains. Uh, 
Uh, I think it's important for all of us to, to talk more about the documentation, not to ha die with a secret or let others die with a secret. The documentation is being, being built out. It's part of the reasons I'm here and, and, and that I encourage uh, uh, groups like the SJAC and others uh, to get out and talk about uh, what's, what's being developed. And, and obviously the, the Caesar evidence, which came out in January, shocked the world when they came to the Security Council. Uh, uh, those that had worked with him and made a presentation in an informal session. I mean, uh, uh, the, 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 the consul was speechless. I mean, literally uh, uh, shocked by, by the nature of, of, of this kind of evidence. And, and frankly, there's a lot more uh, where, where that comes from. And, and we need to show the, 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 the authenticity of it and, and, and the depth and the strength of that evidence and continue it. And, and fundamentally, it's unanswerable. So we just continue this effort and, and make it as visible as possible. And, uh, and, and as we have seen in other situations, uh, uh, the tide uh, uh, will turn. Could you say a little more about what you refer to as the, as the Caesar evidence, these, these, uh, these photographs? Uh, what, is, what is the actual provenance of, uh, of, of this material? How did it... Uh, how did it arrive? Where is it now? What is the status in terms of determining authenticity? Well, let me, uh, you know, describe what I can say about it at this stage, and 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 I think it may be possible to say more in the in, in the near future. But uh, uh, we we familiar with a particular individual who was one of several police photographers who was tasked with with taking pictures of persons killed in, in Syrian government custody. Uh, these bodies were, were brought to a central location from 24 other facilities in which they, they had been uh, tortured uh, to death uh, in a variety of ways, ligature strangulation, uh, burning, bruising, uh, starvation, uh, uh, evisceration, uh, the most horrendous things you can imagine, and uh, with four or five pictures uh, taken of, of each victim. Uh, the total trove of of, of of documents, uh, of pictures, is in the tens of thousands. Uh, we're looking now at uh, some 28,000. There's there's at least an equal amount that uh, that still is 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 to be analyzed. But uh, if uh, it is uh, as it appears thus far, we're talking about more than than 10,000 individuals uh, being killed in custody uh, over the period from 2011 uh, to 2013. Uh, including, uh, including largely men, but also some very, very young uh, men and, bo and boys, uh, uh, and, and, and also uh, women. Uh, and, and, and that kind of evidence in, in terms of the ability to analyze it, uh, to determine that there hasn't been any photoshopping of it, that it's not, uh, uh, that it's not been staged, uh, 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 it's, it's possible uh, through scientific and forensic methods uh, to discount that. And, and, and thus far, the indication is that it would be impossible to have uh, fabricated, to have fabricated uh, this, this, this kind of material. And, and having personally seen hundreds of the images of, of twisted bodies and uh, uh, with uh, real wounds and, 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 and real human beings of every shape and size, uh, uh, this, this, this is not uh, a phony, phony evidence. It's shocking to me as, as a prosecutor. I, I, I'm used to uh, evidence not being so strong, <laughs> to, to there being some greater ambiguity in it. But this yeah. is, uh, this is solid solid evidence of, of the kind of machinery of, of, of cruel death that, that we haven't seen, uh, uh, frankly, since the Nazis. Sir. Thanks. Um, I'm Chris Marnie from the University of Oxford and the Centre for International Law Research and Policy. Uh, and I guess I very quickly have two questions. The first is, uh, who shapes these investigations and to what extent it skews, I guess, the investigative, the investigative trajectory? You just talked about the Caesar evidence, you know, uh, uh, an investigation sponsored by Qatar, in effect, a party to the conflict uh, in, in, in Syria. Um, you know, how, uh, and they, they only looked, of course, at um, at, at this evidence of torture, and I think no one would, you know, would discount the seriousness and gravity of, uh, of that evidence. Um, uh, does that dilute, uh, you know, the legitimacy uh, and, uh, and your ability to then uh, make 
calls for accountability that are taken seriously by all parties to the conflict when you have uh, you know, a party to the conflict in effect sponsoring an investigation which only looks at crimes committed by one side. The other issue is you, you spoke to uh, the prosecution of, of Charles Taylor and that takes us away from what you call command responsibility and towards this uh, issue of aiding and abetting which is in effect largely what Taylor was prosecuted for. Uh, if there's to be accountability in, in Syria, then you have, of course, on one side, uh, the Russian government supplying weapons to the Assad uh, regime, um, and uh, those weapons being used allegedly uh, to, co to commit crimes. On the other side, of course, you have the Saudis and the Qataris uh, arming, the, uh, arming the opposition. Um, and to what extent could uh, any prosecution of international crimes committed in Syria uh, be taken seriously were both supporting actors. And of course, if you watch these PBS Frontline documentaries, uh, which, uh, which show uh, elements of the opposition also being trained by the United States government in Qatar, um, you know, then perhaps uh, elements of the US government come onto the radar screen. Uh, and so th then also that brings us back to this issue of who's prompting the, uh, you know, the question of accountability and, uh, and for yourself, and I have absolutely no doubt in the integrity uh, of, of you personally uh, to be pushing for accountability, but what obstacles do you then face yourself, you know, uh, when you finally get down, you know, to where the rubber meets the road in terms of pushing your own government and other governments that you might work with to genuinely uh, and independently pursue justice for crimes in Syria. Okay. Well, thank you for your questions, Chris. Uh, the, uh, in terms of uh, the, the Caesar, the preliminary investigation that was published in January, uh, in, in which uh, my predecessors, the Special Court Prosecutor David Crane and Desmond De Silva were involved, and Jeffrey Nice, who was the trial leader of the Milosevic case, uh, that was a, a indeed financed through a London law firm uh, by the Qatari government. Uh, that involved uh, sampling in a relatively quick period of time uh, uh, some of the images, uh, they had at least 28,000 available to look at at that time. Uh, and, uh, and also, uh, for, certainly from what I've seen in, in their work, uh, uh, they did uh, a very good job and a very fair job. But uh, my interest has been trying to make sure that all of the documents, all of the photos are available and that they're available to law enforcement offices. As you've heard uh, from Chair Panero, uh, the Commission of Inquiry now has those documents. That's an unbiased commission, uh, which uh, 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 appointed by the UN, which is in which members have expressed different views about responsibility of different actors. And so there will be an ability to evaluate this, this entire trove, uh, not in a way in which it's, uh, it's determined by one state uh, or, or another. So that's one of the things that I've wanted to see done. Thus far, uh, the conclusions the, the, that uh, Desmond De Silva and other reached, uh, I think, have, have held up quite well. But, but more needs to be to, to be looked at, uh, and, and that's and that's ongoing. Uh, in regard to this question of criminal responsibility of leaders, um, obviously in the Charles Taylor case, and in many of these cases where you don't have a direct line of command. Uh, you're looking for the kind of evidence that you have. You, there may have been orders, but you don't have the orders. Uh, there may have been uh, uh, forms of direct responsibility, but what you do have is horrible crimes being committed by uh, a group that's being provided with significant aid by a particular uh, political actor. And then there are ways, as we saw in the Charles Taylor case, that when that, that support is substantial, uh, when it's knowing, and when it, in fact, uh, enables those crimes, uh, that you can obtain criminal prosecutions and convictions, uh, uh, as, uh, as, as we saw in Taylor. In, in other situations in which individuals may be supporting uh, armed groups uh, intending to win military victories, not intending to, to kill civilians, and, and taking efforts to prevent uh, uh, that kind of conduct and to train people in IHL and to lay he vet the people that they, that they train, 
uh, then you then you're in, into a different situation. But but certainly this question of of supporting proxy forces in the world is is one that one has to exercise a fair amount of due diligence on. Uh, no no question about it, uh, because of these kinds of prosecutions, because one shouldn't be in there enabling. On the other hand, there is armed conflict in the world. Uh, this this area of war crimes prosecutions and international humanitarian law is about situations where there are, there are conflicts and where horrible things are, are happening, but the point is to protect civilians, protect the innocent, protect those that are outside of combat. And, and in many horrible conflicts, there has been that kind of protection for all intents and purposes. In this one, there has not been, and, and that's something that we've got to, that we've got to change. Uh, in terms of independence, uh, anyone that takes up the role in an international court has to swear that oath that I, that I swore twice uh, to prosecute uh, basically without taking instructions from any organization or, or any, any government, and, and, and people in national systems uh, at the end of the day had that same expectation if, if it's a system based on the rule of law on independence. Obviously as you know, in Sierra Leone, we prosecuted the other side, uh, Chief Norman, the head of the uh, CDF uh, that fought for the restoration of democracy. It was very controversial, but his group had committed mass attacks against uh, civilians that he had uh, specifically incited. And, and uh, though he passed away before the, the judgment, uh, uh, two of his, uh, uh, his co-leaders were, were, were eventually convicted and are serving, serving sentences. So it needs to be recognized that all sides need to be investigated. That's not to say that, that individuals who, who, who act out of passion and that there are, there's always going to be uh, situations in, in, in a battlefield uh, where, where the innocent are killed, uh, which, is, which is horrendous uh, from, from a human standpoint. But when you're talking about international prosecutions, you're talking about groups and others and governments that have, uh, that have targeted uh, people by the, by the thousand. And so just because, uh, you know, if there are a million people killed over here and 10 people killed over here, one doesn't have even-handed prosecutions by treating them the same. You, you prosecute uh, uh, the massive organized criminal activity. It's, it's not just a political game where you try to balance it off. Sir. Malcolm Lovell of Brookings, Malcolm Lovell of Brookings Institution. Uh, during World War II, the OSS, Office of Strategic Services, uh, had a philosophy which they tried to spread around as many organizations as they could. And that is that when you're dealing with a serious enemy, there are no rules. Do you think that philosophy still applies? Um, I don't think that philosophy still applies, though. I know that uh, uh, for a period of time, uh, Bill Donovan served as, as deputy to, uh, to, to Justice Jackson at, at Nuremberg. Uh, uh, he eventually left, but that's not because he didn't want to prosecute uh, people uh, and not because, uh, I mean, they had personality conflict, I think, if the truth be known. But, uh, but the idea that, uh, that there are rules in, in armed conflict was the basis of our, of our Nuremberg prosecution. And as, as Jackson uh, said uh, uh, in, his, in his eloquent opening, uh, if, if, we, if we try to hold them to different rules than we apply to ourselves, we, we, we raise a poison chalice uh, eventually to our own lips. So these rules have to, to, have to apply to, to, to all. And, and, and tactics in which one uh, goes out and, and brutally rapes or murders uh, uh, innocent civilians are not tactics by which one gains uh, uh, success in, in, in conflict. It's, it's a way that in the end, uh, uh, any kind of, 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 of battlefield victory uh, is, is, is only a pyrrhic one because in the end you lose the peace. Uh, you have a hostile population on your hands. Uh, so as, as we've clearly understood in Afghanistan and elsewhere, uh, you know, the d diminution of civilian casualties, even those that aren't caused intentionally but uh, that, that get caused by the nature of bombardment, is a key aspect of our doctrine. We don't want innocent people dying, uh, even unintentionally. It, it can, it, it's going to happen in conflict. But the idea that we we would do it intentionally 
uh, runs counter to these rules and runs uh, counter to, to, to good, uh, good, good, good tactics. Now, obviously, if you're, if you're talking about uh, commando operations uh, uh, to go in and, uh, uh, and, and, and kill their leadership in the, in the, in the, in the Reich Chancellery, uh, yes, indeed. I mean, that's, uh, there's no rule against that under international humanitarian law. You can target the people that are responsible. I mean, some might say in old days, we wouldn't do such a thing. It wouldn't be chivalrous. But now, no, no question. We can take the fight to the enemy. We can target uh, that, that, that actor that is, that is, that is threatening us, uh, but not, not the innocent uh, people, uh, even some of those that may be political supporters. We don't target those. So uh, there, there are rules, and, uh, uh, and it's important that they be observed. And, and the United States, since Nuremberg, uh, has been a leader in making sure that those rules are applied. And, and of course, the, uh, they fundamentally are in the Geneva Conventions, which uh, have been ratified by every state in the world. Even North Korea is in the Geneva Conventions. So you know, these, these, are, these are universal rules. And, and the rules, like the Genocide Convention and Crimes Against Humanity uh, uh, Code, uh, are part of customary international law, if not conventional international law, and applicable to everybody on this planet, even us. Yes. My name is Danae Patterson. I'm a summer associate at the Public International Law and Policy Group. You touched briefly on different judicial models that could be applied in the Syrian context, ranging from domestic processes to more hybrid or international approaches. And I was hoping you could expand on that a little further. In particular, tribunals like the ICTR often have criticism levied against them for being fairly remote from national judicial processes or more generally the domestic population, with the consequential muting of the sense of justice for victims that many scholars and practitioners believe is critical for sustainable peace building. I was wondering if you think that may be a potential vulnerability of a tribunal for Syria should an international or hybrid model be pursued, and if so, how you think that could be realistically addressed? Okay. Well, um, I mean, you, you raise a justified concern, and I spent almost six years at the, at the Rwanda Tribunal in Arusha, 500 miles from, from Rwanda, and, and a whole different culture and, 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 and part of the continent. Uh, and, and we were more isolated uh, from, from that crime scene. We went over there all the time, but it, uh, uh, it made our work, I think, less significant for the victims and the affected communities. Uh, in Sierra Leone, we managed to do it in country, in a mixed court, uh, with 60% uh, of our employees Sierra Leoneans. And, and so we had police investigators that knew every culture, knew every dialect, uh, could tell us whether a witness was uh, seeking benefits or telling us the truth, et cetera. So, I mean, I, I think that you benefit uh, by being as close as possible to the scene of the crime. The other thing we were able to do in Sierra Leone was, uh, was an outreach program where every community in the country, uh, even in a country without, without television, without newspapers that print more than 500 issues, uh, by the time it was done, more than 90% of the people, according to polling data, knew what the court was doing and, and, and thought it had been a force for peace and stability. So we couldn't have done that if we'd been uh, uh, a thousand miles away. And now when we, when we moved Taylor to The Hague, which is what the regional leaders want, we still tried to make up for it by having those outreach meetings, by showing the videos, by everything else, and we made up for it to, to a point. But better, better, to, better to be there, and better to involve uh, and 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 seek the leadership of people within within that country. Uh, uh, the Bosnia follow-on court, the state court war crimes chamber, I always view as kind of a model. Not nothing is perfect in this area, but with national judges trying their cases in Sarajevo, representing each of the communities, and with internationals there for a period of time. It's delivered judgments for genocide at about one twentieth the cost of, 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 the, uh, of the judgments in, in, uh, in The Hague. So now, of course, uh, that kind of model would depend upon a future Syria like a future Bosnia. I mean, do you want a Bosnia in Syria? I mean, obviously, Bosnia is a divided country and, and not perfect in terms of how it's been able to resolve its political issues. But you could end up with, with, with something like that in, 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 a, in a future Syria with different communities having substantial autonomy, but then maybe a, a state institution that included all of the various groups to try these cases. I mean, if you could get there, uh, that, would, that would be a whole lot better than where, where we are today. And at the end of the day, would be my preferred uh, alternative. I do think there are advantages to having internationals uh, involved in the court, uh, and, and it's, it's particularly when it comes to the survivors uh, and the sort of sense that they have of whether it's going to be fair, that when they look in a particular group of judges and they say, oh, they're from the other group, 
uh, or the other sect, the other <laughs> ethnic uh, uh, group, uh, the, the, they may not trust it. And when you have internationals there, you can uh, relieve that to a point. You also uh, can both benefit to the, the nationals in a sort of working by learning, learn a lot about international law, and the internationals learn a lot about the, the local culture and, and, and situation. So if we could get there, that's where I'd like to go. Now, of course, at the moment, not possible. So we were looking at having cases tried in The Hague if we'd won on this uh, French resolution. And, uh, but it wouldn't have been, if you know the ICC, they've not charged more than four people in any situation in the world. They might charge a couple more here. But it would only go after top people. So there will still be a need for a fair and independent court to try not everybody, but the, the hundred or more who, who have, have been leaders of, of, of serious atrocities. And, and that we should look to, to plant uh, in the area. Greater challenge is what happens if it, the conflict goes on and on and on. Where do you have justice? And, and that obviously is, is one of the things that has stumped people as they, as they look at the sort of legal and policy basis to get a court, uh, a court operating. But, uh, but there are ideas that are out there. Uh, we haven't embraced uh, any specific idea except to continue constantly our efforts to, to find a way to show that there will be accountability and, and to begin the process of accountability. Just out of curiosity, Steve, what, what kinds of ideas are out there uh, you know, for near-term near -term fixes while the, uh, while the conflict goes on? Well, as I, you know, and, and uh, the, the, the problem of vocalizing particular ideas no, is that it begins to, it begins to no look like the, no. the, the, the U.S. Is, is, is embracing them. But as I noted earlier, you had the, uh, the this, uh, Senegal example where Senegal made an agreement with the African Union to try a case that it had jurisdiction over in Chad, et cetera. So it's possible for uh, a country with jurisdiction to enter into an agreement with an international organization potentially to, to have, a, have a court, and then that court can be managed not just by that country and that international organization. You can have a broader uh, donors committee that, that, that works okay. to make sure that it's independent and fair. Uh, that the, those are decisions that would have to be made by the countries that, that, that might be interested in, in pursuing it, and obviously whatever anybody does in that area, one would want to make sure that it, it's, it's not something that opens the way for, for these kind of things to be created for political ends sure. in, in, in the future. It's got to be something that's, that, that's not one country's justice, uh, well, it's certainly Syria's justice, but not, say, a neighboring country's justice. It's, it's got to be justice for the people of Syria based on, on, on international standards. So, uh, but uh, uh, other ideas, I mean, the, the idea of the UN General Assembly, we, we generally view the Security Council as, as uh, responsible in these areas of peace and security. It, it has had the establishment of international courts for, uh, for um, Yugoslavia and Rwanda. It's, it's called for the creation of the Sierra Leone court, et cetera. So the Security Council is the place. But in the Cambodian context, in the context of an agreement with a sovereign country, uh, Cambodia, the UN General Assembly passed a resolution asking the Secretary of General to, to do that kind of negotiation. Those are two precedents. In, in the end, uh, uh, you know, Cambodia has some critic, critics in terms of whether it's sufficiently sure. independent because of the negotiation that occurred, but, but legal recognized structures that the United States contributes to and has evolved to the management of were, were created uh, through, those, the, through those mechanisms. Every one of the things that I've talked about today that have come up in the last 20 years uh, were, were unthought of, yes. <laughs> unheard of, uh, bef before we established the, uh, uh, the, the ICTY and ICTR. Yeah. And so one has to, to think about uh, how to do this. What is, what is unthinkable is that you could have 162,000 people dead and, and not have accountability. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Mohamed Ghanem, uh, Director of Government Relations with the Syrian American Council. The opposition has set up a transitional justice commission. They're also looking into some of these issues. Uh, have you reached out to them? Are you working with them? Is the United States government funding them? That's number one. Number two, uh, in the entire history of the United Nations, there's one 
uh, president only of uh, the General Assembly overruling the United Nations Security Council, United for Peace, uh, the war on Korea. But at the time, of course, uh, a major member on the United Nations Security Council, that is the United States, was interested and they ended up carrying out the bulk of the, uh, the, uh, the operation and it ended up being an American war. Um, you know, given the deadlock of the United Nations Security Council, could this happen again? Or is like, would, would it be feasible? Or is it just, is, is just uh, you know, uh, sort of like, would that be an overstretch? Thank you. Well, on, on the question of transitional justice, uh, certainly we, we support and, and are very interested in the work of, of the, uh, the, the the interim government uh, and, and have read uh, what it's uh, what it's proposed, and, and very much view uh, that kind of work as essential to the future of, of, of justice in, in, in Syria. And, and, and if there are ways that we're not uh, uh, assisting or helping, I'd, I'd like to hear them because I, I'm, I'm, I really appreciate that 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 kind of effort. Uh, in this area of the, of the UN General Assembly, I, I, you know, there, there are others in the State Department that could speak uh, uh, to, the, to, to the international law involved, but in, in these particular areas, we view the Security Council, sad as it is, with the veto and with the ability of, of China and Russia to block uh, resolutions like the one on the ICC as, as the organ with responsibility. Uh, as I noted, uh, the, the only time that there's been involvement by the UN General Assembly was in the Cambodian context where the Security Council was not seized and, and there was some opposition to a Cambodian court and the General Assembly, including many of the regional countries, wanted to see this done and they asked the Secretary General to, be, to become involved and, and, and even intervened a second time when the negotiations uh, weren't resulting in, in an agreement. Uh, but, but keep in mind that wasn't the UN General Assembly acting itself, that was the Secretary General than reaching an agreement with a member state of, of the UN, uh, Cambodia. So the idea of the, the UN acting, the General Assembly acting on its own is not something we've seen in, 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 in the justice area. But uh, uh, as I said, uh, the, the Cambodian uh, the precedent is, is, is out there and is one that people could look at, but, but that requires uh, uh, not an opposition group or something like that. It requires sovereign states or states uh, to be involved. Questions? Steve, in terms of your own, uh, in terms of your own work plan, what's next? What are you looking at uh, 90 days out from now? <laughs> well, uh, <clears throat> you know, I don't want to change the subject to South Sudan, Central African Republic, Democratic Republic of well, Congo. Well, that, that, <laughs> that is a question. But how these much, are how all, much of your time uh, is, uh, uh, is actually Libya, spent on Libya, I mean, Syria. you know, uh, these, these situations are, yeah. are, are out there. And uh, I'll, be, I'll be in Cambodia on the 7th of, of August, where the judgment will be announced in case 2-1, the first ju judgment against the, uh, the former chief of state and the former number two under Pol Pot for uh, at least the initial crimes uh, committed during the 75 79 Khmer Rouge uh, period, uh, and uh, trying to make sure that the resources are there uh, to finish the work of, 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 of that court. So, uh, and then we've got, you know, we've got fugitives. I mean, there are people, that, <laughs> Rwandans uh, uh, like, uh, like Kabuga and Emperanya that were key to the genocide during the 20th anniversary. I'd like to get those guys in custody because every time you pick up somebody for what they did 20 years ago, it's a signal to somebody doing it today, hey, they're gonna be at your door in 20 years. Do you want that? So uh, those, 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 uh, those efforts are out there. I mean, it's, it's trying to, to do what we can to strengthen in these, these institutions. I was thrilled two days ago, uh, uh, General Augustin Bizamungu, the former chief of staff of the Rwandan Defense uh, Force, uh, made famous in Hotel Rwanda because he was the guy that would trade uh, lives for bottles of single malted scotch, if you remember the book. He was convicted, his, his conviction uh, for, uh, for genocide and, and, and other crimes was affirmed with a 30 year sentence in Arusha on Friday. So there are all of those kinds of things that are, that are happening out there. But in, but in Syria, it consists of of making sure that just because there were two votes against it in the Security Council on the 22nd of May, that the signal isn't that there's no hope for accountability. I mean, the signal is there will be accountability, that we will find a way uh, with working with the Syrian people, working uh, with, with our partners uh, to ensure that, uh, that these crimes won't go unanswered, whether they're committed by the regime or whether they're committed by ISIS, uh, whether they're committed by others, and that, uh, and that the, the, the day of justice will arrive as sur sure as it has for, for uh, Augustin uh, uh, Bizamungu and, and Charles Taylor. 
I think, uh, I think these words, uh, the days for justice will arrive, good way to conclude. I think this is something that uh, certainly in the context of Syria, not only in Syria, but definitely in Syria, uh, we really all need to believe this. And more importantly, in our own ways, uh, we need to work for it. Uh, thank you all very much for taking the time to join us this afternoon. And please, uh, please join me in thanking uh, Ambassador Steve Rapp for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you.